Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Walter Orr Roberts Distinguished Lecture. I'm Tom Bogdan, president of the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, or as we fondly call ourselves, UCAR. I want to thank the university and in particular the organizers of the Conference for World Affairs for the opportunity to have this event as part of the august agenda of the Real Boulder Institution. And I want to thank all of you for coming here in the afternoon and being such an interested and interesting audience. I suspect that many of you in the room um, probably knew Walt Roberts, for whom this event is named. 55 years ago, Walter became the founding director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the founding president of UCAR. NCAR's governing university consortium. Walter had tremendous influence over the growth of the atmospheric sciences, and he was widely regarded as a truly visionary leader in the broad international scientific community. We're delighted to have the Roberts family represented here this afternoon by Walt's son, John, and his wife, Elaine Smith, by, wait, got a whole family, then we can clap, by uh, granddaughter Kim McKean and her husband Darren, and most important because they play a very important part later on in this um, event, so keep an eye out for them, Walt's great-granddaughters Olivia and Lawrence. Would all of you please stand up and be recognized by the crowd. I suspect, too, that many of you here probably knew Howard Hunter Higman, who founded the Conference of World Affairs by welcoming James P. Warburg to this stage in April of 1948. Howard and Walter were very close colleagues here at the university and indeed um, long and good friends. They shared a deep and abiding interest in foreign affairs and foreign relations the support of academic freedom and inquiry, and they were profound advocates for world peace, resilience, and sustainability. And indeed, both of them, later this year, would have been celebrating their 100th birthdays. Walt and Howard were not shy about speaking the truth, as it is revealed through science, inquiry, and debate. And the same can be said about this year's Roberts Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Richard Alley. You all have a nice biography of Richard in your program, and so I will not repeat the listed uh, impressive achievements therein, but I will add two pieces of information. Simply to give you an idea of how great Richard's impact has been. First, his discovery that the last ice age that we experienced on the planet came to an end in just three years, has really propelled our understanding of abrupt climate change and how that may work, and has also shattered the popular myth that climate change always proceeds at a glacial pace. And in recognition of his work in Antarctica, an entire glacier is named in his honor. And I think you join me all in sincerely hoping that the Alley Glacier is not, in fact, melting at an abrupt pace, and that it continues to stand for millennia to come. I'm honored at this point to turn the podium over to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Alley. Oh, dear. Thank you so much. It is an honor and a privilege. Thank you to UCAR, the, what has gone on at this university and much of it uh, under your stewardship is truly impressive. Thanks to the Roberts family. And it is great to meet you. It is my honor and my privilege. So I'm gonna tell you a story, uh, ways forward on climate and energy, get, getting good from what we do and what we don't know. Um, I could have subtitled this Unfriending Our Best Friend. And I will show you why and how that is in a little bit. But again, thanks to, to the Roberts family, thanks to you, Carr, uh, thanks to the CWA for, for hosting us, and thanks for you to coming out. 
Uh, I think we have wonderful things that we can look at, wonderful places we can go, and ultimately, I'm going to try to scare the pants off of you and then give you a, an uplifting message before we get out of here. So, so for what it's worth, I, I have had the honor and the privilege of going to Greenland nine times. I've been to Antarctica four times. If you ever get the chance to go, this is Greenland. It is fantastic. Um, you know, you, you get the coast is, is this beautiful place full of wonderful animals and, and wonderful things to see. Muskox, right? They're the same size and shape as a minivan. All right. They corner better. Um, <laughs> Right, and, and the ice is melting, so if you look right over my head here, you can see where the ice sat 100 years ago, that's the deposit, and you see where it is now, but you know, it's still a gloriously beautiful place. And in the days before the students did all the work, um, I used to get on the plane and we'd go up in the middle. This is still one of the more remarkable sights I've ever seen in my life. We are 200 miles from the nearest rock, and this fox came trotting into camp. And, and it's, you know, if you've been in the field a month, you, your socks take on a life of their own. And, and so this is freeze-dried laundry. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I've shown this picture to a few people, uh, but if you haven't seen it, we had been there about a month when I took this picture. So the, the newspaper is now a month old, so that means it's not especially timely, except that it is. <laughs> Now this is what we in the field game call a good day in Greenland. You notice the seat, you can see it. This is what we call a bad day in Greenland. <laughs> just drink it in, you know? It's just truly really wonderful. So what were we doing up there? We're two miles up in the atmosphere on two miles of ice, we are drilling ice cores. And drilling ice cores is this fantastic undertaking and all these wonderful people go to the field and you, you do science. And so here's Kurt Coffey and Wanda Kapsner doing science looking at ice cores. And we make climate records. I could go hours on this, it's fun. But, but at any rate, here's a climate record. 10,000 years ago is right here. Today is over here on your far right. If you just look at the green one, the, the one on the top there, that is the history of temperature in Greenland, not the world, in Greenland. There's a broad arch, and that broad arch is linked to features of Earth's orbit. For example, if each of you is the sun and I'm the Earth, my North Pole does not stick straight up, it's tipped over a little bit. And it nods a little more and a little less, and that takes 41,000 years. And it goes around in a circle, and that takes 19 to 23,000 years. Those change how much sun reaches Greenland, and you see the broad arch. Riding on the back of that arch are changes in ocean circulation. They are changes in how much volcanoes are blocking the sun. They are changes in the sun itself, and maybe some other stuff. And way over here on the right, some of these are recent enough that they have names. And so you can see the medieval warm period is that little wiggle, and then you the little ice age, and then we start into the global warming there at the end. So, so if you do have the chance to go to Greenland, one of the places to go is right down here at the southern tip. This is Valsi. And at Valsi, you can see the cathedral at Valsi. Right, the Vikings go over from Iceland and they settle Greenland. Greenland was always an advertising campaign. Um, Greenland is icy and Iceland is green. But, um, but nonetheless, they went over here and in the 1300s, they built this beautiful church. The last known use of this church is right there. It is, is a wedding on September 14, 1408. And people sailed back to Iceland and they wrote about the wedding. And shortly thereafter, the people left it there and it's still sitting on the side of the fjord. Their neighbors, uh, the Inuit, were fine during this cooling, but you know, it's getting hard for the bishop to get through the sea ice to come visit, and, and so the, basically life was getting hard because of that little cooling, and the people finally said, screw it, we're out of here, and they left. Okay, so, so this, this little wiggle from the orange to the blue is enough to make a difference to people who are living on the edge. Now, I point that out because you'll notice that I have left a white blob over here. And we drilled through that too. And that's what it did. Now, this is Greenland, not the whole world. But if that little wiggle up there is enough to matter to people, 
this thing is interesting. <laughs> and it's about 10 Celsius in about 10 years in Greenland. And it was different things in different places, but essentially the whole world got a somewhat different climate at that time. And it's linked to features of ocean circulation. It's linked to sea ice in the North Atlantic. We're pretty sure we don't face that in our near future. But it is a, a fascinating thing that, that nature can do that by itself. And if we take this and we drill some more, the previous slide is this wiggle over here. So the little ice age is above here and that big wiggle is right here. And you will notice that sort of it was pretty crazy for a long time across here. And then it got boring right up there at the corner. And right there, all over the world, people start growing plants. So if I zoom back in on that for you, there's the origin of agriculture. Here's the weird stuff back here. And up there is the, the less weird stuff. And I want to walk you through. Suppose it's a pretty good year. You've had a little rain. You're a hunter-gatherer on one side. You're a farmer on the other side. What is life like? And this is, I'm going to say later, look, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. If you want to argue with me about that, you should go look in the mirror for a very long time. Okay? I'm going to tell you a story that has people in it. Any story that has people in it is more complicated than I can tell you. But I think I'm telling you things that are right here. So here we go. On the left side, the world is hunter-gatherers. What's life like? You go with the flow. You head down the road. You see what's there to eat. What's life like on the right-hand side? Right? You're a farmer. You spend the summer scratching the dirt with a stick. And, you know, what's life like over there? You're eating. I mean, what are they trying to get us to do? They're trying to get us to eat like hunter-gatherers. What do you eat on the other side? Gruel. All right? This is not a balanced diet. Um, right? And this one may be the biggest one. You're a hunter-gatherer. You get a disease. You leave it behind a tree. You come back in a year and your disease is dead. You're a farmer. If you're a really sophisticated one, you do it so that your neighbor drinks it. And if you're not a sophisticated one, you do it so you drink it. Because you're living with it. And so what happens, basically, is for adults when times are good, you go from a long, healthy life to a life with a bunch of diseases and other problems. And this shows up. This is real. Okay? And yet, the moment it became possible, all over the world, people did this. And they're doing it in Central America and South America and China and the Middle East. As soon as they could do it, they did it. With that choice. And so why would they do it? And the odds are really good because the world was overpopulated. That when you had a drought in your valley, you cannot go in the next valley and find something to eat because somebody lives there. And it's a big rock tribe. And they want your valley. And as people spread around the world, you know, they came into North America and there's stakes on the hoof. And what did they do? They contributed to extinction of those stakes on the hoof. And they're, so they're reducing the carrying capacity of the planet. There may have been a few tens of millions of people. It may have only been a few million. That the world was probably overpopulated at a few million hunter-gatherers. And when you have a drought, your grandparents and your kids die. And that's a really bad thing. And you're willing to put up with a huge amount of scratching the dirt with a stick and eating gruel if you can keep your kids alive. And so we, but you know what's happened since then. We go from being overpopulated at a few million hunter-gatherers to being us with a few billion learn, teach, build, read writers. Right? Without our stuff, our knowledge. And the next thousand people you meet, maybe one survives. Right? Nobody gets out of this room alive. And, and that's, that is, right? And so the, the business that are, learn, are getting along with each other, are cleaning up after ourselves, are learning, are building, are teaching, are growing, are sharing, we need them. These are not optional. This is the essence of us. And you see what's happened. You go to the, I had chocolate covered strawberries for dessert. Right? We have gone from gruel to what we have now. It's fantastic. 
And, and we just truly love it. Yeah, we're rebuilding the garden. It, it's just fantastic. And more and more, this is a story of science, right? I have a cell phone in my pocket. The cell phone in my pocket is a little bit of sand, a little bit of oil, and the right rocks. And Einstein, and Bohr, and Feynman, and Wegener. It's science and engineering made real. And it works. It's a fantastic thing. And be honest. You take it, the sand and the oil and the rocks and give them to the Senate and say, turn this into a cell phone. <laughs> okay? And science and engineering did. It works. Okay? And yes, we had a chat here earlier today about science denial. There really are people that will take their cell phone and send me a note that says, you scientists don't know what you're talking about. Your opinion is no better than anybody else's. Irony is lost, okay? <laughs> Be that man. Okay, but this never ends because there's more people and we want to do better by those people. And there's always more to learn. And so what do we get? If you start thinking about how do we keep this going, how do we keep everybody happy and healthy and terrific for a long time, we often put that under the rubric of sustainability. The UN looked at that and said there's a lot of things we should think about. Soil is an issue, phosphorus is an issue, water is an issue. They said food and, and energy are the biggest ones, but with enough energy you can probably do food. And so realistically, keeping this going is a huge number of things, and maybe getting along with each other is the biggest one, but on the technical side, energy is probably the single most important issue we face. So let me do the numbers. I had the chocolate-covered strawberry for lunch. It is just barely conceivable that I went over my 2,000 calories today. A human diet is more or less 2,000 calories. We did not spend last summer scratching the dirt with a stick. Somebody drove a tractor. And our food was cooked and it was refrigerated and the room is, is quality controlled and I flew out here. You take all the energy used in the US economy, divide it by the number of people and convert it into these archaic units, it is 240,000 calories a day. What you can do for yourself is two, what the outside does for you is 240. All right, it's like you have more than 100 energy surfs to do your business. Surf cook for me, surf clean for me, surf pick up my car and run down I-70 at 70 miles an hour. All right, except surfs can't run 70 miles an hour. So, you know, and we love this, and right now it's about 85% fossil fuels. So we really are living the good life on fossil fuels. We have tried lots of ways to do this, and this history is important. Right, I come to you from Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods. The first European settler gets to Pennsylvania. A squirrel could go up a tree on the Atlantic coast and stay in the trees to the Mississippi. The first forester of the Commonwealth, 100 years ago, a professor from my college named Rothrock, wrote about the great Pennsylvania desert. There were essentially no trees in Pennsylvania. We have a million deer now, they were almost all gone. We have elk now because you sent us a few. We chased ours out. I have, I put my tie on for you. It has Nittany lions on it. We don't have any Nittany lions. There wasn't a tree to do it behind. And there wasn't a deer to eat. And it was the whole East Coast did this. We just cleaned off our trees like nobody's business. This is a part of the reason my college was founded up the hill from an iron furnace. And when the iron furnace was running, it looked like this, and they were turning red dirt and limestone flux and charcoal into the iron that the East was built of. And running this took more than a half a square mile of trees per year for the fuel. And there's a whole community around it, taking care of it, making the charcoal, digging up the ore, a hundred, couple hundred people and they have houses and they cook and they heat. A furnace in blast for one year is a square mile of trees. Now if you go to a gazetteer of Pennsylvania and ask where does the name furnace still survive in Pennsylvania, here it is. Every one of these in blast is a square mile of trees per year. And then when you made the big iron, you make it into something useful. It forges like Valley Forge. They're over here, it's another square mile of trees a year. The trees were gone very, very quickly. Okay, now, if you've ever tried to read by firelight or candlelight, it's not very easy. 
So what do you do on a dark Pennsylvania night? Poor people often used a biofuel called camphene. It burned cleanly. It, it was fairly inexpensive, little tax problems, but, um, but it had this tendency to blow up. So you can root through the, the old newspapers and find just horrible stories. You know, the Methodist minister and his wife go out to visit the parishioners and they leave the daughters home. And the daughters try to refill the lamp and they burn themselves to death. And the rich people used to burn whales. And so here's whaling. And here from 1800 to 1880 is the history of whaling in the Yankee fleet. And you can see the production. At peak, there's something like 10,000 sailors out of New England scouring the world ocean for whales. The drop has a lot of things. There's a civil war in here. There's the fleet being crushed in the sea ice off of Alaska and, and the insurance rates going through the roof. But what was the fleet doing in the sea ice off of Alaska? There weren't any whales closer to home that they could find. The whales that they could catch were gone. And so you see peak whale oil there. You also see a line which is price. Right here at the lowest spot, it's about, in modern money, $7 a gallon for, for lamp oil. Just after you go to the peak, it's 23 bucks a gallon. And right here, they went up the road from where I live, and they drilled the first modern oil well. Now, that's 100 years of Yankee whaling, 10,000 whalers at peak. And it's something like a, a week of oil imports averaged over the last decade or so. You know, the idea that we go back when we run out of fossil fuels is absurd. It's just absurd. But we have whales and trees because of fossil fuels. And they knew this, right? So if you can't read this from the back, this is published as an editorial cartoon in the magazine Vanity Fair in the year 1861. It is a grand ball given by the whales in honor of the oil wells of Pennsylvania. Oil's well that ends well, the oil wells of our native land, may they never secede. 1861, right? We have whales and trees because of fossil fuels. And it is that simple, right? And, and you know, we love it and we can't do it forever. The fossil fuels that we have accumulated over a few hundred million years. We are burning them over a few hundred years. We are burning them a million times faster than nature made new ones. When we quit burning trees, they grew back. When we quit burning whales, they grew back. When we quit burning fossil fuels, they will grow back over millions of years. That's not terribly useful for us. And, you know, the numbers are just flabbergasting. How good oil and coal and gas companies are at what they do is just flabbergasting. What we in America put out to the curb for the trash collector is less than a half a ton of trash per year, per person. What we put in the air as CO2 from burning fossil fuels is about 20 tons of CO2 per person per year. Our trash stream is grotesquely dominated by CO2. If we could see it, we would not be having this discussion. But of course, we can't. And there is a lot of stuff in the ground. If we frack everything, if we take off all of the mountaintops, if we do all the Green River oil shales, there's a lot left to burn. But the easy stuff's already gone. The first oil well, why'd they drill it there? Oil was leaking out of the ground. They said, wow, oil leaks out of the ground. I'll bet there's oil in the ground. Maybe we'll drill a hole, right? I know some of you remember this. There used to be a situation comedy about our energy system. It was a story about a man named Jed, <laughs> right? He was a poor mountaineer and he barely kept his family fed and one day he's shooting at some food and up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas Sea. Why, they can do that. What is BP doing out in the Gulf? They're not throwing money away because they want to throw money away. The easy stuff's gone. Little tiny bits hidden away in national parks. Not much. Not much, right? We have to switch. It is not if, it's when. And now I'm going to walk you through the part where the sooner we switch, the better off we are. Okay? You burn fossil fuels, you put your 20 tons of CO2 per person per year in the U.S. into the air, that affects climate. We've known this for well over 100 years. The physics was really refined by the Air Force right after World War II. Now, the Air Force is not doing global warming. They are doing things like heat-seeking missiles. The infrared radiation from the hot engine of an energy enemy bomber can be seen, it can be followed, and the enemy bomber will not blow up your city. But if you put the wrong sensor on, 
you can't see it because CO2 blocks the view. And the energy is soaked up by the CO2, it's transferred to all the air, and there's nothing hot to see because it doesn't get to you. And if you take a satellite today and you look down on the Earth, the sun heats the Earth, we send energy to space. I will guarantee you that there is more energy today going up from the sun-warmed Earth than coming down from enemy bombers. And so what do you do if you sit on your satellite? This is the Earth cooling off. This is that energy from the sun-warmed Earth going up. And this is CO2 absorbing some of it and using it to heat the air around it. And if there's more CO2 in the air, it can block more. Where does global warming come from as an idea? There it is. It's physics. Right? And so we don't. People say, do you believe in global warming? Do you believe in physics? For our CO2 not to affect the climate, we have to get rid of the laws of physics. We can't do that. There really is not a scientific controversy on this. There is a lot of controversy on what's the best path forward, but that our CO2 matters to the climate, there's really nothing to argue about. Okay? In particular, you cannot hear the other side. Science is the middle. There are people who think we're too alarmist. There's people who think we're not alarmist enough. There are people who think it's going to be bigger. People think it's going to be smaller. You cannot hear the other side. There isn't one. Science is physics. It works. And the military knows how to make heat-seeking missiles. Okay. Now, we could spend an immense amount of time on the evidence. Yes, it's getting warmer. It is getting warmer despite the fact that the sun has dimmed a tiny bit in the last 30 years. It is getting warmer despite the fact that we cut some dark forests and replaced them with more reflective crops. It is getting warmer despite the fact that natural volcanoes and our smokestacks are putting up particles that block the sun. If you ever meet the person who says, let's compromise, I'll agree it's warming if you agree some of it's natural. Now, recently, the last 30 years, nature has tried to cool it off a little bit. So they say you want to compromise how much warming has been caused by our greenhouse gases more than all of it. Okay, so, so yes. Um, now, I want to show you this, right? So this is a, a plot of temperature anomalies from February 20 of this year. And it just so happens on February 20, I'm supposed to go out and talk to a local high school about global warming, and they closed because it was too cold. <laughs> and the next week, I'm going up to teach my class, and I rolled my ankle. I'm off of crutches for, the, for a week now, but I was on crutches for a month. And so, so you know, it's, it's, we in the East, we're freezing things off. <laughs> and there were snowballs on the Senate floor, but we were doing it in a warming world. And so on that particular day, the world was above average, the tropics were above average, the southern hemisphere was above average, the northern hemisphere was above average, the Antarctic was above average, the Arctic was way the heck above average. We were about the same temperature as the North Pole. Yeah, it's getting warmer, it really. This, this, this was the warmest instrumental winter that we know of. And you can see the little blue blob over the snowball fight in the Senate, but otherwise you see it's mostly red. Uh, so yeah, it is getting warmer, okay. Now who cares, right? Global mean surface temperature doesn't mean anything. It's what does it matter to us and other living things that we really care about. And I've got a list of stuff up here. I could walk you through all of these. There's a line at the bottom that you may want to keep in mind. The first degree is pretty cheap, but we've used it. The second degree is a little more expensive, and we're committed to it, and we're arguing about three, four, and five. And each degree costs more than the previous one because we get out of experience. We get out of things we know how to deal with. I'm going to walk you through one up here on the top, the, the heat stress on the crops. Okay? This is just a shade complicated plot, so try to hang with me. Right over here on the left is maize, is corn. And this is a temperature scale from cold to warm. If your corn is too cold, it's not very happy. But if it's too hot, it's not very happy. And in the lab, this arrow right here is under the best temperature. Each dot is a country that grows corn. And how big the dot is is how much corn they grow. And what you will notice is most of those dots are on the warm side of the optimum. We're growing corn at places that may be a little warm for the corn. And on the hottest day of summer, if you give it enough water, 
and on a fertilizer, and you keep the bugs away, and you keep it tilled properly, and you do everything else right. It doesn't grow very well because it's too hot. And you'll notice that as you go to hotter countries, the yields go down. Now, some of that's because they're poor, and they don't have as much fertilizer, and their soils may not be as good. But some of that because they're hotter. And this red means if we keep burning without changing our behavior, 90% confidence using our current science that late in this century when our students are getting old, the average summer will be hotter than the hottest summer we've ever seen. So if our, a lot of our corn is already grown at temperatures above where it's happiest, and by late in the century, the hottest summer we've ever seen is below average in a lot of the world, that becomes important. Okay. Now, this doesn't get us right away. It doesn't get Ontario right away. Um, this red up here is people who are putting out the most CO2 per person. Blue is least. Um, red up here is the people who are most vulnerable to the changing climate. Blue is least. If you've got winter and bulldozers and air conditioners, a little warming doesn't hurt very much. If you don't have winter bulldozers and air conditioners, a little warming is not a good thing. And so on the top is who's changing the climate, and on the bottom is who's hurt by the climate. And if you, if you think those plots look different, and you're worried about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, there's an issue up here. The winners are the fossil fuels, they're rich people in cold places now, and the losers are poor people in hot places and people who haven't been born yet. All right. I want to show you this one, I'm going to zoom in, you don't have to read it yet, but this, this paper came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this year, Climate Change in the Fertile Crescent and Implications of the Recent Serious Drought, Syrian Drought. This is one paper. But there's some other literature that is pointing in the same way on this. And so if we take those words and blow them up where you can see them from the back, the evidence is that drought contributed to the conflict in Syria. And the evidence is that by changing the climate, we made the drought more likely. Now, this is from the first degree of warming, not the fifth one. And Military leaders have said very clearly, said, don't think for a minute that global warming caused ISIS. But if you've got a lot of unhappy people with things not going well, and their crops die and their food goes through the roof, they get unhappy. And so climate change is already a threat multiplier, according to leading military minds. And this is the first degree, not the fifth one. This particular plot just came out, it's a brand new paper. This is not a really high warming scenario, this is a sort of warming scenario. And the red in there is increase in the number of days of drought by late in this century if we keep burning. And green is not an increase in the number of days of drought, blue is a decrease. And if we just zoom in, the tip of my arrow there is a place where humans may have already contributed to unhappiness by making drought more likely and you'll notice it's red. Okay, that's probably not good. And so this one, a year and a half ago, almost, yeah, so this is 2013, so two years ago now, Admiral Locklear, commander of the Pacific Fleet, is in Boston. He gets North Korea. Uh, the Boston Globe found him, and they said, what are you worried about? And he said, oh, well, the warming planet. <laughs> okay, this is not some lefty liberal professor sitting in an ivory tower and making things up. People who realize, realize. Okay. Now, there's an additional piece of this. This is science, it is not revealed truth. There are real uncertainties. But you give CO2 to plants, they grow better, they like it. But for the plants to grow better, they also need not too much and not too little water, and not too hot and not too cold, not too much and not too little fertilizer. They can't be eaten by, by bugs, but they need pollinators. They, they can't be taken over by, by invasives. Giving them more CO2 can't make them grow fantastically better because so many other things matter. But you can kill your plants if they're too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry or a whole bunch of other things. Building Eden means getting everything right. Breaking it can be done with a big hammer. And so the uncertainties tend to be, here is the most likely outcome. It could be better than that. 
it could be worse than that. But we don't see how it could be a lot better. And we do see ways that it could be a lot worse. And the people say, oh, there's uncertainties. You think a minute that you could, building this took so many tools, but you could break this with a big wrecking ball. Cranking up CO2 is not a huge number of tools, but it might be the wrecking ball. Okay. Now, let me show you this. There's another paper that's brand new, just came out from Drew Schindel, Climatic Change. This is similar to several other studies. So this is not the one study effect. There's several other studies have looked at this. And let me pull in a zoom here and then show you this. The blue bar is what the customer is paying across the U.S. for electricity from coal and gas and nuclear and solar and wind. And the yellow bar is the additional costs of putting it in the air and having people breathe the stuff and change the climate and so on. And there's several studies come to similar conclusions about this, that the benefits of the electricity from coal are great. But the customer is, is basically paying for the benefits and society is paying for the costs. And that if you included all the costs in the price of the electricity, you might have a different electric mix. And so the government has something they call the social cost of carbon, which is essentially uh, pieces of this yellow bar, right? Okay, so, um, and what the economists will do is they'll take that social cost of carbon it doesn't include all the damages. Wiping out a rare and endangered species may not have a cost because they're not in the economy. Um, they usually make the normal economic assumptions. The economy will grow lots into the future. We're more important than future generations. But if you do that, and then you optimize the economy, the greatest marginal good of, of what you consume, what it says is that taking some wise actions now to reduce global warming is economically better, beneficial. It makes the economy better off. Right? And, and that's important. You may not always hear that story. If you're on the money and jobs track, dealing with this wisely, carefully, in a responsibly manner makes you better off because you avoid some of those damages. Okay? Then, if you're worried about the golden rule, you're worried about national security, maybe you do more. Okay. Right. So then the question, can we do this? Yes. Right, okay, this is fantastic. Right. I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to remind you, this is not easy, and it's not. But it's possible, and this shows you that it's possible. So these maps show where we get that 2,000 calories per person per day that we eat. The top map, everything in orange there, is where we grow our crops. The bottom map is where we let animals turn grass into steaks and then we eat them. So the 2,000 calories per person per day comes from everything colored on those maps. If we took a modern solar technology, we put it in a sunny part of the earth, and we generated more electricity than is now used by total energy use of all humans how much more of the land surface would we have to change? And there it is. Okay, Existing technology. Now, no one would build that. That is an insane number of solar cells. It will take a long time to do that at best. But that's the number. Some of them are going to be in your backyard. Some of them are going to be putting a shadow on your tortoise. But we have changed all the colored area on the maps to feed us. That's enough to power us. We'll do this one as well. Abe Lincoln, the only president who had a patent for his own invention. Abe Lincoln used to say, we need learning. We need science. We need engineering. We need patents and inventions. And one of the things he said before he's president is, we need wind. The wind is an untamed and unharnessed force. And one of the greatest discoveries will be the taming and harnessing of it. And I show you this picture with the wind turbines and the cattle from a Texas ranch from our TV shows. They get a lot more money from those wind turbines than they do from the cattle. They call it mailbox money. You go out to the mailbox and you pull money out of it. And, and the numbers, we listened to Lincoln. We built these things really fast. And if we built the big ones as fast as we used to build the little ones, in 30 years, the US would have a third of the world's energy. 
And if we put a wind farm on the windy parts of the plains and deserts of the world, not, not the cities, not the water, not the forests, uh, that's sort of five times human energy use. Right? No one's going to do that. It's going to be customized for people. There's real issues with transmission. There are some issues with storage. But the basic picture, can we do this? We're the first generation that can say yes. Okay. And so if you take the full scholarship, if we could sit down for a few more hours and talk about this, the full scholarship says that if we address this the way we address challenges in the past, we do it with, with vigor, we do it with commitment, we do it respecting what we care about and recognizing where we came from and how much good was done by, for us by the oil and gas and coal and how they enable the next thing. We get a bigger economy. We get more jobs, we increase national security, we clean the environment and we honor the golden rule. And I started with the transition from hunter-gatherers to farmers. And it was hard. We're way closer to being able to do this than they were. But at the point where they said our future depends on this, the grandparents and the grandkids deserve this, they did it. And they switched from being hunter-gatherers to farmers. But we're still really hunter-gatherers of energy. We're still looking for the next big thing, and we know now how to farm it. And so, you know, I'll leave you with maybe my favorite picture. Can we have a world with icebergs and rainbows? Yes. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely brilliant, and now you know why a science reporter once called Richard Alley a cross between Carl Sagan and Woody Allen. <laughs> we do have a little time for some questions, but before we do that, um, I'd like to call on Olivia McKean and her sister Lawrence to come up to the stage and make a presentation um, to Dr. Alley on behalf of the Roberts family. On behalf of the Roberts family, I would like to present this award to Richard Alley for his dedicated work on climate control. There are so many reasons for hope for the future. There's two of them. Thank you. All right, we have about seven minutes before um, uh, Ebert interrupt us, is going to actually interrupt us here. So, uh, if we have questions, I hope we have microphones someplace in the audience where people can do that. Otherwise, come on up front and shout your question, and Professor Alley will repeat that question so we can hear it. So, the floor is open to you. Yes. Well, right back there. Hello. Hi. So I have a question about um, the sustainability of the turbines. So if we created that many turbines, like what the adverse effects might be, um, right. you know, on wind patterns or right. based on the materials that they're made of. Yeah. So important question. Um, there's no doubt that if if we're going to eat 2,000 calories a day and power ourselves with 240,000, there's going to be something in somebody's backyard. There is absolutely no chance that we can make this disappear. And wind turbines will have an impact. You will see them. They will kill some birds. Um, right now, I, I have slides that I could have shown you on what kills birds. And wind turbines are down orders of magnitude below cats and, and getting mowed in alfalfa fields and things like this. Um, and probably each wind turbine saves birds because the avoided climate change plus the avoided other things that we would do to get energy um, would kill more birds than what any wind turbine will. So probably building a wind turbine saves birds. 
even though you will find a body at the bottom of a wind turbine. We can't do it without that. There are worries about rare earth elements that would go into the magnets, but we use rare earth elements for, for cracking hydrocarbons for, for refining too. So this is not just a wind turbine issue. Um, and probably, the price of rare earth elements has been way down because of China, and if enough geologists here get busy, they will probably find more, and that's moderately well understood. Um, other than that, the energy, if you build your wind turbine, you count the energy to build it, you count the energy to clean it and run it, you count the energy to take it down, in six months, it makes that much energy. And it's likely to last for 20 years. So the payoff on energy that you get back for it relative to the energy invested is now better than most fossil fuels. So there aren't big issues. There's a little bit, you're roughening the surface, and it's like turning a plane into a forest, and that will change the winds a little bit. It'll have a little influence on the local climate, but probably smaller than the influence of the aborted climate change. So no big issues. Lots of local ones. That cable wants to bring the power to your city through somebody's backyard, and you're going to have to make nice with them somehow. <laughs> yes? Thanks so much. It was brilliant. So much. Um, great, great, great lecture. Um, I have two related questions. One is, um, your slides were fabulous, and I want to know what you think about the the importance of using metaphors and images and storytelling in science communication. And the second thing is the importance of having the arts be an ally in terms of moving people emotionally and physically to do things they might not have the interest or the energy or the courage or the endurance yeah. to do. Yeah, I don't understand it without metaphors. So I, I wouldn't expect, I, I, you know, I've got some math, I've got some physics. In some sense, I'm an applied Newtonian physicist. I, I built ice flow models at one point, but I don't really understand it without the, the stories and the history and the people. And I'm an amateur at this, and I think we have to have professionals too, and lots of other amateurs. So I, we have to engage the arts. We, th this is, this is a, a defining issue of a generation, of a few generations. But the opportunity that we finally can get off of this treadmill, that we finally can get off of, we burned all the trees, what do we do? We burned all the whales, what do we do? We, burned, we can do this. And there's such power and beauty in that. And it's gonna take the commitment of a generation or two, because it won't be easy, but it's doable now. And it's a, it's a wonderful vision of powering everybody on the planet essentially forever. We have a question over on this side. Yes. Uh, great presentation. Uh, will uh, population growth negate all the good work you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Population, you know, the, as, as they sometimes say, it's the third rail of this discussion. Um, and, and, but, um, let me give you the optimistic spin, okay? I could give you a pessimistic one, but let me give you the optimistic one. Where people, including people of all genders, specifically, <laughs> have confidence that their kids will grow up, they have interesting things to do and they have some control over their lives, they choose to replace themselves and not more. Not because anyone told them to, not because of any nanny government getting in their bedroom, but because that's what they choose. And where people are really worried about whether their kids will grow up or whether they're gonna die, they tend to have a couple of extra ones to be safe, especially if they don't have control over their own reproductive health and if they don't have interesting things to do. So more or less, we have seven billion of us, five billion more or less have the good things that I just said and a couple billion don't. And if we get food, water, medicine, and a little empowerment to the other two billion, the projections are that we level off and we're there. And if we don't, exponentials don't go up forever. Yeah. We'll take one last question. Uh, and for those of you who don't have a chance to be able to ask your question, we'll take it from this side. Um, Professor Alley will kindly uh, meet with you out front in the lobby when we get off the stage here so that we can let the next group come in and he'll be happy to take your questions there. So one last question from this side, sir. Oh, thank you again for your participation at this conference. Your wisdom you. is appreciated. 
Um, the deniers like to point to this 30-year period after World War II where uh, increase in, in uh, CO2 didn't necessarily correlate with the temperature. Could you just lay that to rest? Sure, really easy. Um, if you, if you if, first do the natural one. If you turn up volcanoes, particles come out and CO2 comes out. Particles block the sun and they make colder. CO2 traps heat and it makes them warmer. Particles fall down in a year and the CO2 falls down in, in 500,000 years. Um, so what happens if you turn up volcanoes naturally is it gets colder, and then as the particles fall down and the CO2 builds up, eventually it gets warmer. What happened after World War II? We turned on industry. We're going to build stuff for people. We're going to do the great things. And that put huge amounts of particles out that block the sun and CO2 out that traps the heat. So what does it do the volcano thing? You initially cool it because the particles are beating the CO2, but the particles fall down. It, it, down here, they fall down in a week. And the CO2 builds up, and eventually you see the warming. So it, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. <laughs> okay. On that note, let's thank our speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you.